I'm on? Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How are you today? Happy Sunday. It's a beautiful day here in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and I hope it's great wherever you are and that everybody is safe and healthy and probably going a little bit stir crazy, but we're all going to get through this. So today we are going to talk very briefly about the history of knitting, when it started, where it started, and then we're going to kind of trickle on down to get to fair isle knitting, one of our very favorite types of knitting, and talk about the history of that, what makes fair isle fair isle, and how it differs, differs excuse me, from some of the other color work methods that are out there. So the history of knitting takes a lot longer than what a Facebook Live can kind of cover. Um, there's some fascinating information out there about it, so I'm just going to give you it real quickly. Um, it's difficult to say when knitting actually started because for a long time, um, historians were looking at what they thought were knitted garments and they found out that they actually weren't. They were looking at a process that produces a piece of fabric that looks like stockinette, but it's called knoll binding. And it's done with one needle and short skeins of yarn and or short lengths of yarn. And I don't claim to understand it, but it's a little bit of a combination of crochet and knitting. And that produced the stockinette fabric, which was very, very, very durable. And it lasted a lot longer than some of our knitted fabrics. And as technology got a little bit, you know, broader and could look into things a little bit better, we've actually differentiated between the beginning of knitting as we know it now and this knoll bending. But if you want to look up knoll bending, you'll see this pair of these orange socks with the toe that has been knitted in for sandals that have survived since, I believe, um, the early 100s. So that's pretty cool. And it all started in Egypt is where what historians believed and went through um, from Egypt to Spain. And in Spain, it traveled on up into Europe, um, predominantly Germany and France, those regions. And we can track that to the 13 and 1400s by, it's difficult to do this because you know, yarn doesn't last forever. Think these things decompose. So it's hard, it's not like you have these hard, fast materials that you can date. But what they do have are these paintings from um, the European countries in the 13 and the 1400s, predominantly, or most famously, um, the knitting Madonnas, which show Mary knitting. And so they know that the knitting was actually occurring at that time in Germany and France. By the time we got to um, the 1500s, we were up into the British Isles. Knitting has been um, documented there. It was a source of warmth in, at that point, where in Spain and some of the Southern European countries, it was an aristocratic kind of thing. Men did it. Uh, kings, royalty, very, very wealthy people used the knitted articles. They weren't usually garments. They were usually um, socks, hats, small bags, that type of thing. And it was actually a high art form where if you wanted to apprentice into the knitting industry, it took six years, which I think would be kind of cool. I would have liked to have been around there and done that. They traveled all over and got all kinds of ideas, but neither here nor there. Um, but by the time it got to the British Isles and the North, people were knitting for util utilitarian purposes. And one of the things that they um, became very involved in was knitting stockings, wool stockings, worsted stockings. And these stockings became a element of trading for them. The men would go out to sea and fish and the women would stay home and make these stockings and then they would trade with other um, fishing vessels that came from foreign countries and that kind of thing. And the trading became a primary industry in the different Northern Isles. And one of the documents that they found actually from the late 16, early 1700s that they, that 
that I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact date, was an excerpt from a young woman's diary where she had traded a pair of worsted woolen stockings for not only a bottle of peach brandy, but also a bottle of rum. So she had her priorities right. Um, the, the stocking industry was huge and it became really huge in the Shetland Islands. And that's where we are going to focus most of our time today on these Shetland Islands because that's where Fair Isle, Fair, the Fair Isle is located in the Shetland Islands. So Shetland Islands is a series of a hundred or so islands. It's north of Scotland, right off the northern coast of Scotland. And Fair Isle is actually the southernmost of that grouping of islands. So it's pretty far up there, but there are, it's not in the Arctic Circle or anything like that, but it's, it's cold. Um, and Fair Isle is tiny. It's a teeny, teeny, tiny little island. I was, I always knew it had been, was small, but I was amazed to find out today that it's a little less than three miles long and less than two miles wide. So it's less than five square miles of an island. But they had a lot of sheep on that island that produced a lot of wool, and they used that wool in this stocking trade, along with the other islands in the Shetland Islands. And that went on for quite a while until on the mainland that somebody invented a knitting machine, and these stockings could be done on the knitting machine instead of by hand and were obviously produced much faster. So now we're back kind of, well, we had to reinvent ourselves. And they did that with the art of the Fair Isle sweater and Fair Isle knitting. So I'm going to leave the Shetland part of it now and just focus specifically on Fair Isle. So the big question is, when did it start? And where did these designs come from? How, who invented this? Who came up with this? And there's a couple of different theories on how this happened. And nobody knows for sure. I can actually remember my grandmother, who taught my mother to knit, talking about one of these theories. But we're going to take it with a grain of salt, because Grandma Clifford wasn't always accurate in what she said. Um, but... It was in the 1850s when a boat from Spain crashed into Fair Isle. They were on a fishing or trading expedition to the northern parts, and they crashed. And they couldn't get off the island. The weather was horrible. And the romantic idea is that they had to winter there. And as everybody was sitting by the fire getting to know each other, the Spaniards who had this technique taught the people on Fair Isle as a way of repaying them for their hospitality, which is very nice. That's very nice. And a lot of these Spanish symbols that we see, um, or the symbols in Fair Isle, have kind of like a Moorish type of um, flair to them. So it kind of lends a little bit of credence to that. But if you read your history books and you read the account of the ship ca crashing into Fair Isle, if you can find it, because, I mean, it was such a tiny island and, you know, it wasn't that huge of a deal, I think, whatever. Um, the history book will tell you that the people who lived on Fair Isle were, A, they were afraid of being overrun by all the people on this boat because they didn't have enough food. It was the winter. They couldn't feed them. So they didn't feed them. So they starved. And if they were hardy enough to not starve, they threw them off of cliffs. So I don't, I don't know which is true. Um, it, we can go with either one. Another way that people think perhaps these motifs and designs came in to Fair Isle is through a husband or boyfriend or whatever was out trading on a ship and brought home either a woven shawl from perhaps Spain or a piece of pottery that had a motif on that somebody said, I'm going to translate this into my knitting. And that's probably the case of where it came from. But I kind of like that Spanish thing too. Um, so that all, whether you go with the Spaniards or the piece of pottery, it all happened around 1850. That's where we start to see the Fair Isle knitting taking place. And it grew and it grew in popularity. They liked the garments in this area because, and we'll talk in a few minutes, you have to use two strands of yarn. So it was double the warmth. They kept them warmer. It was a great artistic expression. And these sweaters be started to become very, very desired by people 
um, in other countries and they would trade for those and they actually, because of the huge dearth of woolen stockings, this was more of a novelty. And in the early 1920s, the Prince of Wales actually had his portrait painted in a really cool Fair Isle vest. You can look that up, it's a Google. Um, he got his portrait painted in this beautiful vest that he had gotten while he was visiting Fair Isle, and then it really took off. It's a Everybody wanted a Fair Isle garment, and it really sustained not only Fair Isle, but the rest of the Shetland Islands too, because they, they were, you know, all in proximity, they adopted the whole idea. Now, in the latter part of, or the mid part of the 1900s, with machines and all of the rest of this, the whole industry kind of changed. The hand knit sweater was not anywhere near as financially viable as it was to put one of these together on a machine. And, but everybody wanted them. They, are, they were at the height of fashion in the 70s. Everybody wanted a Fair Isle look sweater and they became copied and, you know, several different versions of them became available because of the whole being able to knit them on the machine. And one of, I'm going to look here at my notes because I'm going to read a quote from for you. One of the most prolific Fair Isle knitters is Alice Starmore. She has beautiful, beautiful work. And her inspirational quote, if you read her book, is that um, many of the Fair Isle garments that are seen these days may well be machine made and disappointing in quality. But every now and then there will be an example that strikes the eye and proclaims that the art is alive and well. And then she goes on to encourage us as the knitters to be the person that creates this thing that keeps the art of Fair Isle knitting going. And it's one of my favorite things to do. So I'm kind of passionate about it. And I, th I think that quote, I'd like to have it on a t-shirt. I really like it. Um, so now I want to tell you exactly what Fair Isle knitting is, what it's made up of versus some of the other types of knitting where you have knitted designs in your, um, in your fabric. So the overall umbrella of this is called stranded color work. And stranded color work means that you are carrying two strains, two, two strands of yarn at the same time and you are overlapping them as you go from color to color. Generally, we never carry anything more than four stitches. Four stitches is considered excessive. If you go to some of the hand knit places um, in Shetland that are still producing Fair Isle, they will not carry them more than two. Um, but there's many types of this stranded color work. Fair Isle is notate well let me tell you first of all what the types are there's fair isle there's norwegian there is icelandic and there's faroe island knitting and um one of the branches of norwegian knitting is the i believe i'm pronouncing this right when i say shelbu but i could be wrong but that's a branch of norwegian so with the exception of the icelandic all of these sweaters have a couple things in common they're all done in the round they have dropped shoulders. They are made with at least two colors. And there are never more than two colors in any one given row. So if you are looking at something that has four or five colors in the same row, I'm not even sure what type of knitting that is called, but it's probably done on the machine. It's very difficult to do. A lot of knitters will go through and do a design and um, keep the to the rule of two colors per row. And then if they want to add like a little color of a centered flower, they'll go back and do a duplicate stitch to get that color in. But the the rule is no more than, well, two colors per row. And then from those same characteristics, we kind of branch off on the um, individual characteristics. Fair Isle started off where you would have two to eight colors. 
And the reason that there were only two to eight colors is because we're, the dyeing process wasn't so good. All right. As the dyeing process became better and better and better, the Fair Isle kind of restrictions relaxed a little bit and there could be more colors, but never more than two to a row. It's also done with a uh, lighter weight yarn, a DK weight yarn. That was the weight of the yarn that the sheep on Fair Isle tended to, it was the easiest to spin. The wool, once it was carded and gone, it, it lent itself to this DK weight better than the heavier weights which some of the other island types used. Um, the Fair Isle distinguishes itself by the designs being done in stripes. So this example here of this um, young child's vest, you can see all these different designs, but they're in a stripe format. It's an overall design that covers the whole garment, and that's characteristic of Fair Isle. Um, the designs can repeat themselves, but they're done in different colorways, so they look completely different. And that's what makes Fair Isle different from some of the other types of knitting. For example, Norwegian knitting. Norwegian knitting is another color work knitting. You use say, DK or lighter weight yarn there. They are usually uh, decorated at the top of the sweater around the shoulders and the neckline and then sometimes at the waist and they often have a little um, V or an inverted V that's called lice and sometimes that's over the whole body of the sweater. So it's very distinguishable. You don't get these stripes. You get either a solid piece with a highly decorated neckline and um, something around the waist ribbing or else just the little lice, the little picks of color throughout. And that's what makes Norwegian, it's close, it's related, but it's not the same thing. Um, an Icelandic knit, and we call this in the store all the time, oh, I'm gonna Fair Isle, I'm gonna Fair Isle. Well, I, the Icelandic knit started out very, very closely related to the Fair Isle and Shetland and uh, other sweaters until about 1950, where they got a look at a native costume of, in Greenland and decided that somebody decided, oh, I think I'm going to try to knit that. And then that became very involved in their knitting culture. The defining thing about an Icelandic sweater is the yarn that it's used. It's a lopy yarn. You get it from when you card the sheep and the women would spin it itself. It's a rough yarn. It's um, a little bit heavier than a DK weight yarn. So it tends to be a heavier garment. But most of the yarn in Iceland is this lopy type yarn, which it's pretty cool. And it, everybody says, I can't use it, it itches, it itches. But once it's been um, soaked and blocked, that itch goes, tends to go away. But an Icelandic sweater is a sweater, we have this, in, and you can see the yoke here of this um, garment where it's made by evenly spaced uh, increases throughout the top of the sweater. And that yoke is very, um, much reminiscent of the yokes of these cop of these costumes in Greenland, which Iceland is kind of near. And so that's what they kind of adopted as their own sweater and took that and the increases stayed the same. The basic pattern for an Icelandic sweater is the same, but the designs, the charts all changed. And that's kind of cool. So now you know when you are looking at one of those sweaters that are so popular right now, you're not looking at a Fair Isle sweater, you're actually looking at an Icelandic sweater. And then the last type of stranded color work that I'm going to talk to you about today is um, the Faroe Islands. The Faroe Island um, color work, Faroe Islands are uh, if you're in Scotland, you go to the west and you go about halfway between Scotland and Iceland. So they're not up as far north as the Shetland Islands, but they're up there in the cold weather. And they have a wonderful breed of sheep there. And with the Faroe Islands, they 
we often hear the term fisherman knit sweater. Well, they were the ones that actually developed the fisherman knit sweater. And what they did, they would take um, the yarn from the undercoat of the sheep down around its belly, that soft, um, more inner wool, and they would ply that with the outer wool of these sheep. If you saw them, they're very, very hairy. They look like big hairballs, and they would take them, the uh, the outer um, coat, and ply it together so you would have this piece of yarn that was soft, heavy, and virtually waterproof. That's why it was a fisherman's knit sweater. And they would knit these sweaters. It, originally, they were all one color. Um, they were done in the round. They did have the drop shoulder. Once the popularity that they could see of, of these stranded color works got over to them, they adopted some um, of those techniques and they will put an all over design. It's two or three colors. They don't use a lot of colors in um, Faroe Island knitting and the pattern repeats itself throughout the, the garment. And it tends to be a heavier weight yarn that you're using instead of with Fair Isle or Norwegian knitting. But the, all, of those, um, all of those methods come under uh, stranded color work. And then I have this example to show you. This is a really pretty cardigan that we have in the shop and it's stranded color work. You can see the floats in here and how they're caught. It became kind of popular a couple of years ago to wear these things inside out. I never quite got that, but okay. Um, but this doesn't fit any of them. This is neither Norwegian, Icelandic, Pharaoh, or um, Fair Isle, but it is stranded color work, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's beautiful. But when we say, oh, I did a Fair Isle sweater, we didn't really. We did a stranded color work sweater. Um, other forms of color work can c include intarsia, mosaic knitting, just doing stripes, all great methods um, to get color into your knitting, but they're not fair aisle knitting. So it's cool now to know what you actually are knitting, and hopefully you're inspired to go out and do a, either a, well, some type of stranded color work project. If you've never tried it, there's great videos. You can watch Chris's video on the Moonwake Cowl where she does talk about um, an introduction to Fair Isle Knitting and it's wonderful. And, th but there's, and there's lots of other ones out there. It's a great skill to expand in your knitting. And if there are any questions, I would love to take them now. Because I feel like I've been blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Anybody got anything that they want to say? Hey to everybody. I, it's nice to see all your names coming up and such. I think it's really cool. I love this. Um, we are enjoying our little live Facebooks, trying to get you as much information as we can in a relatively short amount of time. Um, I really appreciate you watching them and sticking with us. Next Sunday, when we are um, doing our Facebook Live. We're going to have a fun um, little demonstration and our producer of Facebook Live, which is not me, it's Shelly, has decided we're going to call this what? Notions on Notions. Notions on Notions. It's, it's cute. And um, we're all going to, everybody who works at the shop is going to talk about what their favorite notion is and what it can do for you and how why you should have this in your little box of tools. And if in the next week you can think of anything you would like us to talk about as far as needles, we're going to talk about the differences in needles. We're going to talk about stitch markers and crochet hooks and all kinds of things. So um, we, if you have anything that you would like to know about, if you want to know the differences in, you know, like soaking when you're going to soak your garments that kind of thing just drop us a line the producer we got to get somebody in for hair and makeup um the producer will be happy to field those and we'll make sure we answer those um live but i um i again i appreciate you listening and have a great week knitting. Be as creative as you can because it's a great outlet for your stress. And hopefully we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.